start the recording, just to let you all know, this session will be recorded and made available on our website by the end of the week. So if you missed any part of it, please do check back under past webinars, and you can uh, catch up on everything you missed. And if you're ready, I'm going to go ahead and make you presenter. Okay, thank you. All right, everyone, have a great session. Hey, Rachel, the... Uh, yes. The uh, show, my, show My Screen button isn't coming up. Oh, weird. Okay, let me take over being presenter again and try it one more time. Let's see. Let's see. All right. How about okay, now? There we go. Perfect. Yep, there we go. Okay, so everybody can see my screen, and I will go ahead and bring this up. So, uh, like Rachel was saying, this is uh, Master Data Services in 2012. My name is Eric Jones. Uh, everybody just calls me AJ. I'm the Principal Technology Manager of PTI. Uh, we've got a lot to go over today, so just a little bit about myself. 20-plus um, years of programming experience, 10-plus years of databases experience, and that spans over SQL Server and Oracle and Sybase and a bunch of other systems. Uh, several books, uh, blogger at programmersedge.com, and if anybody wants to follow me on Twitter, my handle is uh, Programmer's Edge. So enough about me. Let's go over the agenda. We're going to look at uh, basically scenarios with it within the enterprise for master data services, uh, model deployment, web UI, uh, any base staging and subscriptions, and I'll be showing you the, the uh, latest Excel add-in and using uh, what's called data quality services, uh, DQS, uh, that's built in with that. So uh, first off, we're talking about scenarios. So since a lot of you don't have experience with master data services, uh, it might be good to talk a little bit about you know what is and what's not master data. So um, you can think of master data as your reference data within uh, your systems that may be uh, duplicated or used by uh, several systems and uh, master uh, data is a, a way to uh, gain hold of that data based on uh, procedures or uh, using technology uh, so that basically everyone sees the same vision of the data. Um, Normally, without an application, you have to write a lot of procedures in order to control uh, data. So if we were to think of master data in terms of reference data, uh, we may think of it in terms of lists, uh, lists of uh, salespeople, hierarchies of uh, sales regions, stuff that's non-transactional, really, stuff that doesn't change very often. So you're not going to use master data services uh, to manage something. Uh, like um, product uh, purchases. Instead, you'd use it to manage the list of products. And uh, MDS actually works with a, a wide array of scenarios. And the thing that you've got to uh, kind of wrap your heads around is that MDS is, is basically uh, two main pieces, uh, one being a database. And one of the neat things that they did with the 2012 version is that they enabled it to be able to be used with a 2008 R2 database. So um, the first version of MDS came out with 2008 R2. And for all intents and purposes, it was a, a V1. So uh, some of the things about it uh, you know, really sucked. And then uh, us testers went and complained about it. And Microsoft uh, you know, came around. And this version is like the light years ahead of the previous version. So if you're looking at getting into master data services, uh, if you can hold off to, to wait to the 2012 version, I think you'll experience a lot less pain moving to that version because they've taken a lot of the stuff and taken a lot of the advice that we've given them and have really made it drop dead simple to implement. So we'll be going over some of that stuff. Uh, the other thing uh, that you, you have is a, a WCF web service. So if you can think of this as a service-oriented service architecture in that you're not going to use necessarily master data to uh, replace other systems, 
but you're going to use it integrated in with uh, systems that you have. So in uh, some cases, you may be looking at lists of uh, salespeople. And if you have an organizational chart of salespeople, and those salespeople exist in five different stovepipe systems, which is often the, the case in enterprise environment, you know, you may have different views of that, those salespeople uh, data in each one of those systems. And what you can do with MDS is kind of create a one-stop shop where the data is actually validated and purged before you actually push it out or it's actually consumed uh, by those source systems. Now that doesn't mean you have to rewrite the source systems in order to incorporate master data services. Most of the time when I'm doing it, it's something as simple as an SSIS routine that goes and takes the data from master data services and goes out and touches each one of those five different stovepipe uh, applications and updates the, the uh, salespeople's data in each one of them. That way uh, you have one place where a clean version of the data is stored and then uh, you have policies and procedures about people not updating the data on the, uh, on the actual applications and then it's updated from, uh, from the master data services aspect. Um, and what you've got to do is, uh, you know, Think, think about the data that you use and think about, you know, where it's duplicated at. So that's the easiest way to figure out, you know, where you could use master data services. Do you have a chart of accounts that needs some kind of management around it? Uh, think about how you want to cleanly manage the data. And it doesn't always have to deal with, um, you know, just being able to release a clean version of the data. Master Data Services also provides you a lot of other things that we'll see here where it tracks the transactions for you. So if any of you are, are um, you know, held to Sorbanes-Oxley, HIPAA regulations and that sort of stuff, it makes it dropped out easy to go and instead of writing a bunch of triggers to see who, uh, you know, changed the data and everything, you can just, you know, do a, a query on a, a couple of views and, and provide reports to the uh, auditors and stuff. Um, and, and like I said before, think of MDS as a portion of your solution and not the solution. So it's not like you're going to come in and implement MDS and it's going to go and, and take over everything and replace all your previous applications. It's, it's not meant to be that. It's meant to be a little cog in, uh, in the big uh, machine of, of things. And these three common solutions that I show up here, BI uh, is big, data warehousing, cleansing uh, your reference uh, tables before you actually upload them into the database. Uh, it can be a data provider, so if you want to write a third party uh, application uh, to tie into a data, uh, master data services database, you can expose views and uh, pull out the data that way. Uh, it's also used as a, a data consolidator. So um, one of the key aspects about master data services that we'll look at here is that you can uh, have a one-stop shop for your business rules too, which makes it really nice because you can uh, write up all these business rules in an easy to understand language and you can have them apply to the set. You can even call those uh, rules from things like the Excel add-in and stuff to make sure that your uh, data is consistent. Okay, so example, uh, like I was saying before, if you think of, uh, you know, phase one of implementing this type of stuff is after you get it installed and everything is, you know, identify your data. So identify, you know, I've identified multiple instances of sales personnel, right? Then phase two is to figure out how to consume that data. So Consuming the data can be a, a one-time uh, thing where you uh, just consume the data and that's housed within master data services and then your business workers update the data within master data services and you're done. Uh, or it could be through uh, you know, some kind of scheduled import process. So they do allow you to have an import process and now in 2012 that's fairly easy. Um, then uh, you go on to validate. So this is where you would go and set up your business rules. So you could set up business rules that say, hey, a salesperson has to be assigned to a region or a salesperson uh, cannot have a certain code within their value, that, that type of stuff, to either invalidate the data or maybe change the data to a default value uh, before it's consumed by one of these external systems. And, and then uh, phase four is, you know, providing it. 
getting out there. So, and that's mostly done through uh, what's called subscription views, uh, which are typically used by SSIS packages to, to pick up a view. And it's just a view in SQL Server once it's created, pick up the view and provide it uh, to whatever system is trying to consume it. Okay, so let's talk about deployment. So deployment is a little bit different in this uh, version of MasterJ services. Now uh, they, they still have the wizard, but the wizard is only used uh, through the web uh, interface, is only used to do a model structure. So you can't go and import a model that already has data in it, which is kind of uh, uh, kind of less than optimal a lot of the times because a lot of times when you're trying to deploy a model for the first time uh, or deploy an update, you've uh, done it in development and you've already uh, set up a bunch of data to go along with it and then you're wanting to deploy uh, the data without having to do it all over again. So MDS model deploy actually allows you to do uh, just that allows you uh, to you know, list your instances, uh, create a new model, uh, clone an existing model, uh, update a model, as well as export models. And uh, it's basically, uh, basically a backpack file, which means that it's like a backpack, except it's got structure and it's got uh, data in it. Okay, so it does model as well as data. You don't have to always have the data. You can just have the structure. And uh, deployment now has four distinct steps to it. So when you're running this command line utility, it's basically going to go through these four steps. of Model objects are created. Uh, the business rules are established. The subscription uh, views are created. And then the very last thing is that the data is actually populated to the uh, system. So depending on the size of your model, uh, it you know, usually only takes a couple minutes uh, to, to actually deploy a model. Okay. Now there are some caveats with this. Okay. The first one is the most important is that you can only deploy to a version that a model is created from. So you you can't go and take uh, a previous SQL ser Server versions model and then take that model and then deploy it uh, to uh, say a, a SQL Server 2012 instance. It's just it's not allowed. Uh, what you, you can do though is, is just upgrade uh, in, in place, upgrade the database, uh, and then you can go and export the model and, and uh, import it. So uh, now if model creation fails, and, th and this is the important part here is that, and sometimes even though you've created the model and you've exported it from the system, there are instances where the model creation fails for one reason or another. So if model creation fails, and it fails on the steps one through three that I, I showed you there, then the model is deleted and you don't have to worry about anything. Now, if the uh, model update uh, fails uh, on, uh, I'm sorry, step four, uh, then it stops, okay, but the changes aren't rolled back. So the, uh, when you're updating the model and it gets through steps one uh, through uh, three, it'll stop, but any changes that you made to structure are going to be within the, the model now. So what you have to do is you have to make sure that before you deploy updates, you have to have a, a good backup because otherwise you may just totally hose your model and then you'll be trying to figure out how to, uh, to get it uh, updated properly. Now you can redeploy uh, the model and everything and that usually straightens everything out. It's, it's not really such a big thing, but it, it can be frustrating. So things that are not included in it, so things that you don't necessarily want to you know, spend a lot of time in uh, development thinking that you're going to export them, but uh, things like metadata, uh, things like file attributes, and uh, group permissions are not, um, not exported. So what you'll need to do is when you're deploying from development to uh, production is that you'll have to you know, kind of map these things out or you can even um, work against the web service to apply uh, permissions and stuff, group permissions uh, for individuals. And uh, get that all straightened out so that you can deploy the model and then deploy your group permissions. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's jump in and see a little bit. So the the command line uh, usually 
uh, it comes with uh, a couple packages here. So when you go and you uh, load up Master Data Services, it will come with some sample packages. And that's pretty much what we're going to be looking at today, except for this demo uh, pack that I'm going to uh, set up. So uh, chart accounts, customer and products. So this gives you a pretty wide range of things that you can look at. And this is just under uh, Program Files, Microsoft SQL Server 110, Master Data Services, Samples and Packages. Now the uh, MDS uh, tool, the location of it, is actually under Master Data Services Configuration. So that's where the MDS Model Deploy location is. And normally what I do is I just set this up within the path on my, on my server, on my laptop like I have here. And then that way I can call up the MDS model deploy without getting some kind of carpal tunnel syndrome by typing this all in. So when we're, we're looking at uh, master data services, there's a couple things that we want to do. One is we want to be able to list services like I show here. So it's just MDS model deploy and then list services. Okay, so if we go in here, this will actually go and show us which services are available on the machine. Now, this doesn't work remotely necessarily, but uh, in the background, basically what it's doing is it's checking uh, some uh, registry entries and stuff like that to see what's going on here. Now, you'll, you'll see that if I look at my uh, loading information here. I'm going to deploy a new model, right? So I call MDS deploy. I just tell it deploy new and then I've got a couple of switches. So one is to tell it where the package location is. So this is my chart of accounts package location here and then I'm going to tell it uh, what to call the model which I'm just going to call it chart of accounts, right? And then the next one is to uh, go and say, hey, you know, what's the service? Now, Looking at this list, a lot of people get confused and they think that they that they have to go and give it you know one of these services here. So you can see I've got three versions of MDS up here right now because I do a lot of MDS work. But really, you know, I'm going to be using the MDS 2012 one, and what the command line wants is this one over here. So it's just simply MDS one, MDS two, MDS three. Okay. So if we go back and I load that up, chart of accounts, you'll see that I'm just calling this command line and this should take about 23 seconds uh, or so to load. So it actually goes through de uh, deploying the steps. Now it, it doesn't give you a really good idea of what's going on in the background uh, while it's running. So depending on the size of the package, uh, you know, it can take anywhere from uh, a couple seconds all the way up to, you know, a couple minutes. I've even had it, it take a half an hour in one case. So, so here it took 20, uh, 28 seconds and it deployed. So that's all it took to deploy my model. And it's loaded not only uh, the structure but also the data for me. So if we jump real quick into the slides again before we go and look at the UI enhancements. So, now, in the previous version of MDS, one of the main complaints was with the web UI. The web UI was uh, kind of clunky and it caused a lot of refreshes. It wasn't even really very well Ajax or anything like that to provide a, a good user experience. So they basically went and, and gutted the uh, end user portion of the UI. The administration portion is, is pretty much the same thing that we saw in 2008 R2 with the few little exceptions. Uh, so basically they improved overall usability and performance and one of the things that they did with the user functional area that's called the Explorer is that they uh, made everything into Silverlight control. So now the data loads much more fluently, you've got a lot uh, better uh, look and feel to it, you can add and delete stuff uh, better. Another thing that they added in here that I'll demonstrate is that uh, one of the one of the big big problems with working with things like hierarchies is that when you have to move something in a hierarchy, right? You usually have to you know go and 
uh, in the background do a lot of uh, T-SQL gymnastics in order to get it to work. Well, they put in this cool feature that allows you to uh, drag and drop or cut and paste uh, you know, hierarchy members from one area to another, and it automatically takes care of the uh, moving for you in the background. So that's pretty good. I usually use the cut and paste, which I'll show you here in a second, the, the drag and drop. Uh, maybe I'm getting older, but the uh, the icons and stuff are just way too tiny for me to drag and drop. I always end up dropping in the wrong location. Um, the Silverlight UI also makes uh, filtering more easier for your users. Uh, it's got pretty consistent navigation across all the screens. The only kind of caveat that I have to that is in their breadcrumb trail, they won't show a, a home button. You have to just know that in order to get back to the home page that uh, you have to click the Master Data Services logo. And they've added things like waiting and collections, so that's not you know, too cool, but let's just take a little look at the web UI. So I'll just open up Internet Explorer here. And we'll just go out here. And this will fire itself up. So you've got really two pieces to this UI. Okay. And this is all set up so that, you know, by permissions, you're only going to be allowed to do whatever you're allowed to do. So it's not like uh, it's a one-size-fits-all and everybody gets access to everything. So here your users can install the add-in for Microsoft Excel. The Explorer is actually used to look at the data. So if we were to go in here to the chart of accounts that we loaded a little while ago and click Explore, it's going to take us to the uh, chart of accounts page. So here I can actually go through and I can look at the chart of accounts and it'll load these values. It provides drop downs for anything that's, uh, that's uh, based on a, a domain model uh, within the set. So I can basically do, you know, as a user, do everything that I want to do. I can look at uh, hierarchies uh, that I have, either derived or, or static ones. So these are some derived hierarchies that they've set up. If I go back and I pick something uh, like product, let me pick customer, and I go back to explore with customer, and I pick one of the customer types for the hierarchy. Okay, so this is an actual hierarchy that's based in here, and you can see up at the top here that we have a little key for copy and paste here. And that allows you to go in and, and say, oh, hey, I, you know, I'm loading these members. I've got to take these guys here, and I'm going to copy them, and I'm going to highlight you know, this guy in the hierarchy, and I'm going to paste those members into there. And then, boom, it's already taken care of moving those values for me in the hierarchy. So that's pretty cool. Now, if, we, if we're taking a look at, say, products, Okay, then you can see that you also get this little icon. If you just hover over the icon, it's saying uh, awaiting uh, for revalidation. So one of the things about the system is that it does have business rules in there, and the business rules basically work uh, you know, for you to make sure that your data is validated properly before it gets out into the, you know, the real world, if you will. So uh, when you're looking at this, you can go and you can say, hey, I want to apply the rules to this. It'll go in and it'll say, hey, this validation failed. And then you can go into the validation checker and say, hey, why did this you know, validation fail? And it'll actually show you those values. Now, the administration side, there's a couple different areas that you would choose. Uh, version management is uh, where you go in and you actually manage your versions and your version flags. So on, uh, on some of these uh, values and stuff, they have flags. It gives you a status of open, and you can actually lock the models while you're doing your validation and uh, when you're committing. You can uh, view ancestry of, of models. Uh, so this is, is where you would go about in your versioning to go out and deploy a version. Okay. You can also validate the versions, and it also uh, keeps track of all the transactions that occurred. So for you, for you folks that uh, are you know tied to uh, Sorbanes Oxley or Dot Frank, something like that, you have to have auditors come in and look at logs of what's changed, who changed it, everything. You can see that basically. You know, all of this stuff is captured in the back end, 
and it allows you to, to pull that out. There's a couple of views in the database that allow you to pull that data out too, so that's pretty cool. So let's go back to the uh, slides. So just all around a better experience in the UI. Okay, so any base staging. So any base staging is uh, your uh, your tables, what, what you would call tables within your model, are actually referred to as entities. So if you think in terms of, uh, if you've heard of any framework before, it's the same type of lingo that they use for any framework. You have a model and you have entities, and then those entities have attributes which you can uh, think of as uh, your columns to your tables. And in V1, what caused a lot of pain is that you have this kind of two-stage loading for the uh, uh, for your data staging, and everything went into like a common table, and then you had to tell it you know what type, and you had to have metadata along with it, and then send the data, and it was all a big mess. So now uh, data staging in this version is like way more enhanced. So it, it gives you the ability to secure, uh, uh, staging at the entity level. So every time uh, you create a, an entity in the system or update an entity, uh, it modifies or creates a staging table for that entity, which makes it drop dead easy just to import data into the system. They've even uh, created this in a separate schema, a stage schema, so you can limit access to that staging environment. Um, significant performance improvements as far as loading data into a staging and then uh, calling up the uh, store procedure to process that data um, and just basically overall easy integration with uh, SQL Server integration services. Okay, now subscription views. Now subscription views are how you get data out of the system, right? So uh, when you're looking at that, you're looking at, uh, hey, I want to expose this data now to my uh, applications or consumers that are going to use it. Uh, so now I'm going to create a subscription view. Uh, and that can be performed in uh, hierarchies or uh, in uh, leaf nodes. Uh, it allows you to see the status of the objects, which is important when you're doing data warehousing. So uh, you could conceivably create a view, um, and then you would be able to look uh, at the status to determine if you need to uh, actually update that item or not. So if you're, uh, something's awaiting uh, being validated, you could just pull the ones that are already validated and then update that in your data warehouse. Okay. Now sometimes, and this is kind of a caveat, sometimes hierarchies can be a, a bit problematic, and, and that's due to the fact that just the way that hierarchies are, are structured, the views are going to flatten out those hierarchies for you, and if someone changes uh, the hierarchy uh, to move something where it's you know not obviously supposed to uh, be at, you know, there's not an, an easy way to uh, validate that necessarily. Okay, so let's go and check this out. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, jump back in uh, to here, and I'm going to go over to integration management, which just is where you import data and, and do all that uh, kind of stuff. So I am uh, going to go in here, and, and import data would be if you uh, manually want to uh, import batches. So you can think of this as you're loading stuff up into the staging tables, right? It's getting set up in a queue up here for you to go and, and start to run those batches for you. Okay, so uh, create views is where you create your, your views for stuff. So if I wanted to, uh, say, create a subscription view, I just hit create. Um, let's see, we'll just call this product list model. We'll do a product. Uh, we'll do a version, and this is one of the, the key things if you're thinking about doing views is that you see that I'm able to uh, do version or I can uh, actually do it by a version flag so that I can go and flag my versions so that uh, I have a current version. So this is usually the smarter, way, smarter way to do your views is that if you have a version flag on it and then you're constantly setting the version flag to uh, current for the new one that's coming up, 
uh, prior to the prior one that was done and then archive for anything older than that and then planning for the one that you're, you're planning on. All you have to do is do the, the uh, subscription view by the uh, current flag and you know that you're always going to get the most current data. So that way when you update versions you don't have to go and, and worry about updating all of these uh, subscription views so that they point to the uh, correct version. But here we don't have anything flagged yet so we're just going to go in here and say we're going to do product and the format is we're just doing leaf members and then basically we save that okay and uh, then this this will uh, basically tell us you know what's what's going on with the flag if we go out here uh, to our database now and let me refresh this and then we create you'll see that now I have a view in here that's MDM, MDM product list, and if I have everything in a thing, you'll see that uh, the view goes and exposes all of my data, as well as version information in there, and down at the end, it should give me a validation status. So this is where I can go and I can check to say, hey, you know, these are rows that I may or may not want to uh, present to the uh, the receiving uh, system. So, okay. Now, on the uh, on the actual tables, if we look at the table structure here, and we scroll down quite a ways, okay, you can see that now we have a staging schema, and we have uh, basically uh, one. Uh, staging table per entity, right? And it tells us whether it's a, a leaf, or if it's a relationship, or it's a you know consolidated. It's, it shows us all all of the stuff. And if we uh, would go in there and just look at the design, we can see that you know these go and give us you know all of the columns that we we need as far as uh, updating the system, and also uh, gives us ways to. Uh, update uh, current values and also to identify uh, batches and batch tags and uh, stuff like that that are important during the import process. So pretty, pretty easy once you uh, once you get used to it and stuff. Way better than the uh, previous uh, way to do it. And then, like I said, there's a uh, store procedure down here uh, for for actually uh, processing. Uh, that it's in staging. UP. Okay, my eyes are missing it right now. But there is a store procedure that you call to process basically all the batches that are waiting in stage. Okay, so MDS Excel add-ins. So let's talk about how uh, MDS is going to make your life a, a, a lot easier now in this 2012 version. Is that you know you have the idea of master data services, and now you've had these five systems with salespeople data in it, and you've basically been the one responsible for uh, doing updates on this because most of the time when you have Business users, the ones that know, you know, who the salespeople and, and everything are. A lot of times, we're forced with them uh, doing updates to to everything, and what that m more than likely involves is them handing you an Excel spreadsheet and saying, "Hey, you know, you need to update these values in the the, uh, the system, right?" So, what we want to do with this uh, version of MDS is we want to provide uh, basically the business users, the ones that know the data, the ability to you know load, update, publish all from Excel, which is you know their normal workspace. Okay, so uh, here they can do everything if they have permissions. They can do everything from uh, creating new entities and attributes, so they can actually model out uh, uh, model out their models within Excel and publish those models up there. They can update attributes to models. They can uh, go and uh, define attribute constraints. They can validate uh, data. They can go in and they can correct entries. Uh, so this is really a, a one-stop shop 
uh, for the users. And the really cool thing is that it also uh, integrates with data quality services. So if any of you have seen uh, any of the information on data quality services, it's a really uh, cool interface that allows you to set up knowledge bases. and uh, built into the interface is uh, ways to do uh, string matching and scoring to detect duplicates, which is what we'll look at here in a little while. Okay, so still add in demo. So let's look at some cool demo stuff to show us how to save some time here. So if I go out here, okay, I just got an Excel uh, spreadsheet called Locations, right? So I'm going to open that up now. You'll notice that if we if we look out in uh, our models, right? We have models. We have this this demo model that I've, that I've created here. Okay, and there's nothing in demo right now. It's just pretty much an empty model. So I've I'm a I'm an end user. Uh, I am uh, you know I've asked uh, my master data services DBA. AJ, can you create me a model called demo and give me rights to it so that I can create some stuff in it? Now, if the user already has uh, the Master Data Services Excel add-in, you can see that they get a Master Data Services tab, just like they do for Power Pivot, just like they do for Team, just uh, for uh, Team Foundation Services and uh, load testing. So, my Master Data Services tab over here. All I have to do is you know, I'm going to create a connection. Now it does save the connection uh, for the users. It's all Windows-based authentication. And basically, uh, to actually set up a, a connection to do a new one, all you're looking at is to give it a description and then to give it uh, basically the URL to the Master Data Services web service. Once it, it has that, it's totally uh, WCF calls uh, for services in, into uh, Master Data Services. There's nothing technically, not a lot built into Excel other than to, to handle displaying the, the data and handling, letting the user know that they're updating stuff or not. So if I go in here, I connect to my local uh, data services instance, I'll get a pane called the Data Explorer that you can kind of see on my left here. It allows you to pick uh, different models. Uh, you can pick actually different versions if there's different versions available. If I look here at my chart of accounts, it has all of these entities that are already created. If I check out my demo, demo doesn't have anything in it. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to create some entities. So I'm a user. Uh, I basically have uh, this spreadsheet with locations, divisions, location type, and I'm going to create me some entities. So all I have to do is hit Control A because I'm going to select my data. And this is how the rules work: is that you want to have a row up at the top, okay? And those are are basically uh, what your attribute names are going to be called in the entity. So uh, a row at the top to name basically what the columns are going to be within the entity. I select all the values. I tell it create entity. Okay, I just have to tell it which model I'm looking at, which version I'm looking at, and I have to give the entity a name. Now, there is uh, one, uh, one thing in here where you want to ensure that you're not uh, naming a new entity the same as an existing entity, and that's pretty fairly easy to, to uh, uh, make sure that you don't do. And then it's going to ask you two things. One for a code, which this is just the unique identifier uh, for the row, and uh, the other is uh, a name. So that's basically kind of like the display name. So th those of you that have worked with uh, SSAS, um, this is very familiar to you. You'll go and you'll code, uh, name, I pick OK. It's actually calling out to the WCF service right now to go ahead and take those columns, uh, create me my uh, stuff. It's already published out there. You can see on the uh, Explore that I've already got location in there, right? The uh, blue uh, highlights, those tell me that, hey, this stuff has actually been updated and, and sent to the system. If a user wants to go in and change data, they can just go in uh, to each line and uh, change the data. Oops. So if I wanted to change this to, uh, say, 6,500, it's going to display and show me that, hey, this value has changed. I go and I try to publish, 
it automatically asks me to, you know, to try to annotate it. So I can either annotate for all the changes that I've made, because if this is a very large spreadsheet, I'm an information worker, I just go through bam, 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 change all my stuff, and I do uh, one annotation for all the changes, or I can go in here and it'll pick up the individual annotations. The things that are changed, you know, ask me to annotate each one of those individually. So uh, change the square footage, right? So and then I'll publish. Okay, it's as easy as that. Once it turns blue, you know that it's it's been uh, published. Now they can go and use this show status button to go and show the status. So you think see things like validation succeeded, uh, input status. So this says it's unchanged. Okay, because that's because uh, it has gone out and published that change, right? And then has pulled down the fresh set. So that's why this one, even though I changed it it shows unchanged because I've already published and that means that the change has been sent and now it's pulled down the data so now this value is, is unchanged now. Okay, so we'll hide status. So now we want to go over to divisions and we want to go ahead and do the same thing. We want to, you know, uh, control A, create entity. I'm going to pick demo model. I'm going to give this entity a name. I'm going to uh, say that uh, the division and the thing about the name is that I can give it the same thing as the name. So here I have division, description, region, division, division. I say, okay, I'm going to do that. And it's thinking about it. It's updated. We'll just close down this. That seems to be, give us a little wonkiness. So now it's already updated in the system. I have a name and a code. You can see that those are the same thing right now because it, it goes ahead and sets that up for me in, this, in the set. I have a uh, region here. Now one of the things that we want to do is that we want to be able to provide uh, the users uh, some way of uh, validating their data to make sure that they enter the right thing in. So if I have an east here as my region, I want to make sure that they don't enter in something like easternly, right? So all we have to do is we have to click at the top row header here and select region. And then go over here where we have build model and we have this, uh, this button here for attribute properties. So if I select that and I say, hey, the attribute name is going to be region or we can call it reg, right, for this. And then I look at attribute type. So not only can I define it and say, hey, these should be text values, but I can also define them as numbers. I can say that they're date times. I can say that it's the length. Or this last one, I can say it's a con uh, constrained list, right? So I want it to be a, a list of items. And it actually allows me to say, hey, just populate the attribute with values from the selected column. So it's actually going to go through this column, and it is going to uh, going to uh, say, hey, the new entity is going to be reg, and it's, it's going to compile me a list of unique values for reg, and it'll spin. And if you look, now I have a drop down. So now I have a drop down to use. So now as a user, I can, you know, not, you know, try to uh, mess things up too much. And if I do try, and I try to enter in something like Easternly, right, which is not in the list now, and I try to publish that. I won't annotate it, but I'll publish it. You'll see that I come up with an error. Not only does it give me an error, it shows me which one uh, errored out. And if I hover over this, it tells me, you know, what is wrong with the data set. So, hey, this is, this is actually, uh, you know, in error. So I'll change it back to East. I'll say I'm sorry. I'll go ahead and publish. Okay, now it shows unchanged. Now, if I right click on the, uh, the row, right, anywhere in the row, I can go and I can see which transactions actually occurred in here. So this is great for like auditing stuff. So you can see that I, uh, I went and I set an attribute value here, description, uh, set value here for region, 
but you don't see where I changed it to easternly, and you don't see where I changed it back really to east, okay? That's because the system is smart enough to not send that data up so that your uh, MDS system has dirty data in it if it can stop the user from entering in at their location. So it's uh, validated, it, it's failed, and it sent it back with a code so that now the user can uh, fix the data before it's actually published to the system. And it's even smart enough to know that, hey, when I changed it back to drop down to east, that was the same thing it was before. So it's not going to write a new entry in the, uh, the database or change anything. Um, so we'll go over here to a location type. We'll do the same thing. We'll create a, uh, an entry for location type. We'll say it's a uh, lock type, right? Uh, we'll just say that the uh, uh, store type and description, we'll say OK. OK, so you can, you can see that it's, uh, it's published my stuff. It's, uh, it's got it out here. So now if I'm a user and I want to add an extra attribute, I want to say minimum square foot, right? This turns up green, meaning that, hey, this is a new column. So the rule is, is that anything that's right next to a column that you've uh, already used in, in the header, that's going to be considered a new attribute. A row that's below is considered a new row, okay? So if you do anything over here, like calculations or anything like that, or graph, this is just plain Excel. So the users don't have to get outside of their, their normal environment. So uh, we'll enter in some... Uh, some values here, uh, 5,000, we'll enter in 20,000 for these. So all I have to do is uh, uh, publish this. Uh, it goes up, it publishes, it turns to blue, so you know that it's it's done and it's taken care of. Uh -huh. Okay, so um, now this system is, is set up. One thing that we want to do is maybe we want to tie these into uh, those uh, ones that we just created for those uh, attributes. So here I have division in my location item. So here on division, I'm just going to select attribute, and I'm going to say, hey, this is a, a constrained list again. I'm going to say, instead of populating with values from the column, I'm actually going to uh, drop down and say, hey, I want you to you know, tie it into division. Right, and it, now you can see that this looks very much like what you would see in a, a cube somewhere, right? And I can do the same thing to location type. I can go in and say location type, uh, constrained list. I'm going to uh, say location type. Bam, it, it's joined too. So, so now everything's linked up and now everything's uh, joined together. So now look, let's look at a couple other scenarios. So one scenario might be that I want to close down this list. I don't necessarily want to save it. But I have a user come along with new data. Okay, so this is always the case. I have a user come along with new data. How do we get this new data into the, the system of, you know, the MDS system? Well, the first thing we do is we have this spreadsheet. We just tie into MDS. So I've logged into MDS. I pick demo, okay? I want to open a new sheet, okay, because I'm just going to double-click this location. Bam, so it's pulled that information down from MDS. I have all my location data that's currently in the system. And what I'm going to do is basically this. I'm going to go in. I'm going uh, to uh, go to location. I'm going to say uh, publish and validate combined data. So I'm going to combine data. It brings me up a very similar, uh, a similar uh, screen to an Excel process, right? So I'm just going to click that button and minimize it. I'm going to jump over to my other sheet. I'm going to control A everything, right? That puts it up in here. I'm going to expand it again. It's going to tell me, hey, you know, I'm not going to trust that these columns line up perfectly. So it makes you actually pick the columns to make them line up. Okay, and as soon as I do that, you can see that it's added in a column for source, so you can use this to uh, go and use an attribute to tell where something came from, and it added all of these guys in. Now, 
one of the things that we may want to do is we may want to go and check for uh, you know any kind of duplication. So uh, if we want to match duplication, we're talking about data quality. So I would come over here and I would say match data, and I've already got a little uh, a DQS uh, system over here for data quality services. And it's simply a matter of, hey, I, I want to check these particular columns. So I'm going to check uh, name. I'm going uh, to uh, check, uh, say, uh, division, and then I'm going to check store manager for whatever reason. And then domain, you can kind of get a, a feel for what uh, DQS gives you is that it has all of these goodies in here for country regions and, and places and U.S. states and, and stuff. And those can even be tied in. Those knowledge bases can be even tied into third-party services. But all we're going to do is generic string. So we're just doing string matching. So here we just want to do string matching. Here, if you've worked with uh, neural networks or uh, some of the uh, analysis services stuff, you uh, become very familiar with these these weights. So we're going to you know go and, and weight uh, name as 80, uh, division as 5, and then this as, if my math is correct, 15. And it shows you total weight down here. If your total weight doesn't add up to 100, it won't let you click OK, so it keeps you from messing up there. I click OK, and it, it'll spin through here for a little while, and then it will uh, try to validate whether or not you know, we have uh, any missed uh, duplication items. So we'll let it spin for a little bit. And then, uh, you know, one of the other things that, you know, we uh, may want to, uh, to actually look at is, uh, while that's spinning, is creating some kind of business rules around this, right? So we, we have our uh, interface here. Okay, if we go into uh, system administration and we uh, go up to the manage tab, we can see that over here we have business rules. And I can jump into business rules and I can pick my demo model. And then it's going to ask you the uh, entity and we will want to do it on location maybe. So it, it basically asks you, hey, what member type is this going to be applied to? I've only got leaf members in there now. So I just uh, go ahead and I create one, and we're going to call this the uh, n square foot rule, right? So uh, I've called it min square foot rule. I use the uh, little slide rule uh, pencil here to edit the uh, business rule. And this is just like in version one, so this is totally drag and drop. So you're doing an if then uh, statement. So if conditions are this, then do this. So um, we're, we're uh, going to go here and we're going to say it is less than, and I'll just drag that on conditions. Now down here at the bottom it says, you know, select an attribute. So this is an attribute to apply to. So if uh, the square foot is less than the attribute, and I can even go and uh, remember my location types I had added uh, those minimum square feet to. Looks like I didn't, uh, I didn't get it updated. I didn't get it updated enough. So we'll, we'll go and we'll try the business rules next time. Let me go back in here. Okay. So now while we were messing around with the business rules, you can see that it's identified these values as possible duplicates. So um, there's nothing that's preventing you from updating the values right now. Uh, you can go in there and you can uh, update the values as, as much as you uh, uh, want. You could take these values or you can uh, delete them. Now all I'm doing here is I'm just uh, deleting the, the uh, rows. I'm not actually going and uh, deleting them from the database. So if you're looking to uh, delete uh, items, right, that has to be done uh, through the interface. You, you can't really do it through this interface because when you just delete a row from here, you're basically only deleting it from Excel. It doesn't understand that you, you want to delete it from there unless you actually use the uh, delete key. And 
that delete key is the one that you want to use, okay, if you want it immediately deleted. So if if you're playing around with stuff and, and you're you're not wanting to really delete it in the system yet, you're just trying to see how something looks, is that you don't ever push this button because it, it'll be deleted automatically in the system. So I could go and I could publish this, annotate it, and it's, and it's done. Right. I can even go and set filters on this, and that would allow me to filter the view based on you know any of the criteria that I, I specify. Um, it also allows you to uh, the the send query allows you to send that filtered list to your users so that they can uh, utilize that on uh, on uh, their end, and it basically sends an attachment in the email. You pick that up from email user double clicks it and it opens up to the uh, view that you were looking at. So it's a pretty kind of cool feature for being able to uh, share data back and forth. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. So let's go back to the slides since we're getting ready to finish up here. Okay, so uh, uh, any kind of questions or anything, uh, here's my uh, email. Uh, Ari.jones at pti.net, so that's my real email, so you don't have to worry about it going in some uh, drop in somewhere. Uh, Programmers Edge is my website. You can hit me up on Twitter too. I go under uh, Programmers Edge, uh, and you can uh, check out my uh, company's website, which is uh, pti.net. So okay, we great. Um, thank you so much, Ari. That was great. That was a great session. I learned a lot. Thanks. Um, we do have a couple questions. If you have a second. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I have plenty of time for questions. Great. Um, is there an integration with SharePoint? Uh, there, not right now, not with SharePoint, but you, you could. Uh, I have not tried to uh, take the Excel add-in and add it into SharePoint yet. From my understanding, that's a coming up thing that they're working on mm -hmm. so that the Excel services in SharePoint would support this. Okay. What about integration with SSAS? Oh, analysis services. Yeah. So you don't have you don't have direct integration with analysis services, right? But like I was saying before, what you would do for uh, your cubes is that for your uh, reference data on your uh, imp import routines when you're doing your ETL processes to update your uh, reference tables is that you would create subscription views, right? Uh, for uh, your cube and then ex uh, uh, basically do an ETL process to read that view and process it into your uh, your reference data. I guess okay. you could always for your for your cubes too while you're uh, processing you could set up your uh, your view in the cube to read you know from the MDS database because the database itself you got to remember that it's just it's just a database. So subscription views are nothing more than views. So anything that you could do in in the database with views, you can do with uh, master data services. Oh, perfect. Okay. Um, does Excel come with master data tab, or is this an add-on? This is a, an add-on to Excel. So you know you'll have your uh, Office loaded up uh, already on there. And then uh, you'll just run that add-in, and the add-in will add this tab. Now, if you don't, if you don't have Excel, right, then you can still use the web UI with the Silverlight controls uh, in it. It makes it way easier than what the previous version uh, was. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> are there any data size restrictions, row count restrictions? Um, I do not know any offhand. I think that the the row counts, um, as far as row counts within the the database, no. There's there's not. The only limitation you would you would uh, basically have is if you were pulling something into Excel, and then you would be limited by uh, the limitations of Excel. Which I, in 2010, it's like you know, billion rows or whatever. Okay, great. Um, just updating. Uh, values on the entities update the source database as well. Uh, updating values on the entities, no. So you've got to think of this system as uh, kind of your your source system. So you would have 
uh, basically a process, and some of our clients right now uh, will have processes that run once an evening, once a week. Uh, they'll even have ones that run every half hour to go through and, and update uh, the applications that consume the data uh, to, to have them basically updated. But when you're updating an entity in here, right, it gets updated in the uh, Master Data Services database. And then uh, once it's uh, you know, uh, validated and published if you want to uh, go through all of the validation publishing routines is that you would pick that up through an ETL routine and update your application score. Okay, great. Um, can multiple people work on the same entity at the same time? Yes. Yep. Oh, great. That's yeah, definitely allows, it allows that, yeah. Um, is this for Excel, is this only for Excel 2010? Um, I think that they have it backwards compatible with 2007, and I can check with the uh, MDS team on that. If you just want to send me an email at the uh, area.jones at pti.net. Okay, and our last question is, how does one import data from SQL Server directly? Oh, from, from SQL Server directly? Yeah. So uh, if, you're, if you're importing data, right, it's fairly simple. You'll have a, a staging table uh, uh, that's lined out for your entities, and then if you if you have the SQL Server database that you were importing from, and it was on, say, this uh, this same instance of of uh, SQL, right? You could write a very simple store procedure to uh, populate the table, and then uh, basically you call. A one store procedure uh, within the MDS database, and, and it will go through all of your staging tables and uh, go and, and process all the data up into the system. Okay, well, so thank easy, you so easy. much. Thank you so much, Ari. This is a great session, and I look forward to um, hopefully the future ones that you're going to co present with us. Okay, thank you very much, Rachel. All right, have a great uh, rest of your week. Okay, bye bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone, for joining us.